So guys, you got to be stoked today. We're really lucky because we got a great program lined up for you today. Um, we did it off the cuff, uh, which is great, but it came through. Right now you're at a site that was just done about a month ago. So you're looking at a very baby kind of a restoration site that we're going to monitor now for the next three to five years and replant and things like that as we move forward. As part of today, um, we have a special guest for you, which you don't even know about yet. Ooh, square. I'm not going to tell you, oh. but we're going to meet them in Bradley Beach. As, so after this, you're going to see more of a kind of a tidal kind of a restoration. Then we're going to take you to the Maritime Forest and walk you through there, which has taken 12 years. And we just did the final dedication on that, um, I think in May, and dedicated it to Julie Shrek. You're going to see a lot of changes. Well, you were there. I was there. That's right. So there's a lot of changes that happened there. And then as we go through that, give you just a tour of that probably, we're going to go to the dunes. And we have 500 dune plants you guys can plant for us. And you might see there's a little tray behind this tree, which is that kind of hid. Um, we've got about 50 goldenrod that we're going to plant here. So we're going to add to this. So you're going to learn the different kinds of ecosystems that we kind of restore as we move through. And I'm going to explain why we do it, how we do it. Zach's going to give you a little instruction today about what a living shoreline is. So you've probably heard that buzzword or, or nature-based strategies, things like that. These are what the, the buzzwords are out there that we're doing here. You're going to learn that there's different types of living shorelines, uh, all kinds of things like this. But before we do anything, we usually come down to a site as a restoration practitioner and we look at the site. And what's going to be interesting, and Zach's going to stand there later, but you're going to see what this looked like before. Behind you, you have a pump house. That's critical infrastructure. This starts bringing in our partners for a project. So Neptune doesn't want to lose this to the inlet. And to be honest with you, where this tree is, if you come out about maybe five, ten feet where Zach's going to stand, that was all gone. That wasn't here. Okay? Basically what you had here was a frag band. That's your high marsh. That's all you had. And then you have a stress low marsh. And you're going to see all that here in a little bit once we go through it. But one thing you always want to know before you start a restoration project, what are your conditions? You want to talk to the stakeholders. The stakeholders are the people that live here. They know more about it than you. They see it every day. Okay? You want to know about the ecological history of this area. And then you want to know a little bit about the cultural history. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to Shark River Inlet. Welcome. <laughs> and I want you to be very wary of one thing. Keep looking that way when you can. And you're going to understand why this area needed help. And I'm going to let you just think about that, ponder about that for a little bit. And towards the end, I'm going to ask you, why do you think we did what we did? And, and how do we do it? And why do we think that way? So, so some of you might not know, but Shark River Lama used to be known as, and I had to write this down, <laughs> and this is part of my master's, just so you know, I just Shark River. Oh, so, no. uh, it was known as the Nalaquest River by the Lenape. So before Europeans came, this was inhabited by the Lenape, Native Americans, and they lived off the inlet, basically. Okay? By about 1689, it was first recorded as Shark River Inlet, or Shark River. <laughs> Nobody knows why. There's all kinds of tales saying, oh, you know, a shark came up and ate people and it was loaded with sharks. I mean, who knows? Um, there's also, maybe it was pronounced differently. Uh, who knows? But anyway, known as Shark River. And predominantly, the industry in Shark River in the beginning was oystering. Okay? There was actually 300 one-acre sites for oyster harvesting in Shark River at that time. And that lasted up and through about 1900. Okay? Planning was big, fishing, and if you look around, you see all the trees out here. Milling, milling was huge. When we go to Bradley Beach today, Bradley Beach was actually called like Bradley Woods. And what did you say about uh, Seager? Uh, yes, Seager is a town along the coast near Bradley Beach. Down that Beach. way. Yeah. Um, and there, if you look at their town, um, like slogan or for the thing, I think it is like the place where the cedars meet the shore. So it was a huge cedar forest. This was so uh, forested. And now you will not find that. Uh, yeah. There's only little pockets that remain. Yep, so this area was heavily forested. Um, when the Europeans came in, they settled here. It was maybe about, I think, 100 families actually working in England at that time. But this all changed. So as more settlers came in, what do you think kind of changed this? What do you think started happening? 
development. <laughs> of course. Got a check question. If people move in, <laughs> they got to build. Destruction. So they started building land development. Land development actually changed the morphology of Shark River Inlet. Mm. Shark River Inlet became, started getting shallow. And this is because people were developing so close to the, to the river itself. Because of that shallowness and the change in the morphology of the inlet, sandbars started to form. Oystermen are out here trying to move the sandbars to get the circulation so the oysters can eat. It didn't work. So guess what? By 1920, Shark River Inlet was only open for recreation, basically. The commercial industry crapped out. It was gone. No more oysters. Still clams. A lot of clams. As a matter of fact, today, one of the biggest resources out here is hard clam. But you can't harvest them because the water conditions here are classified as prohibited for harvesting of anything. Okay? Now, the water quality over time has improved greatly. Okay? Shark River is on the back, coming back. Uh, unfortunately, it's still shallow. Again, what do you think causes the problems here? We talked about it earlier. <laughs> Us. <laughs> it's anthropogenic, sure. <laughs> so, land development. But now, from stormwater runoff, mm -hmm. sediment's coming in. It's sediment's in here. It's a very shallow inlet. Basically, if you go off these channel markers, you could run aground pretty easily. Um, I've kayaked all around here. It's not even worth fishing right here because it's only about a foot deep. So we can actually wade out probably a good ways here and maybe be about that deep. So today, there's good news, okay? It's not grim. <laughs> this area also is known for its horseshoe crabs, okay? I've run a tagging program out of here for horseshoe crabs since 2006, and we tag at five different beaches now. And we're seeing numbers, which is good. Um, we've had have we have had fish kills here, of course. So when we have kind of warmer weather, uh, I think the last one was around Memorial Day a few years back, where uh, Menhaden, also known as Bunker, uh, big fish kill, hundreds of thousands all over the beaches, and nobody knows exactly how it happened, but there was low oxygen, low tide, a lot of fish came in. Some say that maybe dolphin kind of chased them in. Um, and because it was so much, there was an oxygen, a biological oxygen demand that couldn't be met. And the fish started dying. And then they kind of got pushed out by the tides up and down the beaches. So that's kind of the, the general history. Shark River Inlet's beautiful. Um, a lot's been happening here. Um, I think what we, we're going to learn today is you really have to think about a smart, kind of balanced restoration approach because there's different ecosystems and all of them have connections. All of them have connections. Um, even today, which is really great, if you build it, they will come. You can see an egret sitting right here on the sill. And, and, and I'll go through that once Zach talks about living strong. I'll go through the components of this project. Um, we had a great blue heron there. Um, you can still see on this upland area that we've been planting. Uh, we have groundsel bush. Uh, things that you're going to see at the maritime forest, too. So some native species are here. We do have Phragmites. And just ask me later about the Phragmites and why it's still here. Um, and then we have some bayberries and things like that. So there's still some native species here, but in between we want to fill those gaps and really bring it back. And, and, and think about that too. Why do we want that here? And think roots. That's all you got to think. <coughs> I want to show you exactly where the shoreline was. Right here. All this was gone. None of this was here. This actually, from where that little shrub is, came all the way in here like that. And there was a giant tree right here that's already gone. Okay, that tree went. Some of the things that Zach talked about, before I go into the project specifics, two words I want you to remember today, and I do it every year, don't I? Uh, adaptive management. Yes. You need to remember those two words. That's key in any kind of restoration project because you're not always going to get it right the first time. You can do all your modeling check the symmetry you can do all these things but still mother nature is going to tell you how it needs to work okay and that's when you come back what zach was kind of alluding to too was something more programmatic it's not a one-time fix coming out here and doing this one time and leaving it with sea level rise climate change we have to come back and look at these and monitor as we go and address that and then apply it across the track to other projects where we can and say hey here's what we learned at this one how does that work with this project and move forward that way Okay, so what you're seeing is where, where it was. I, I would be right now, you probably only see my neck where I'm standing. 
So all this is gone. Um, this was a collective effort. So one thing you're going to learn too again, well another thing, you're going to learn so much today. This is a great day for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's partnerships. So partnerships really make a project go. Um, when you look behind you, you saw the pump house. That's from Neptune's. So Neptune has an interest in this project to protect their critical infrastructure. The condo association here actually has an interest for the fact that the, the inlet is encroaching on their property lines and eventually these condos would be gone and drop in, okay? And it could happen rapidly. What you're seeing here, and if you go on Google Earth and just kind of focus in, you can do the aerials over time and see how this is eroded and what's really happening. And what I usually do is I take like a spot and I say, okay, let me just look at that. Like in Barnegat Bay, we have an area that's heavily eroded and they had shuffleboard courts there back in the 70s. The shuffleboard courts are gone. You can see over time how they, they're, they're leaving because it's the shoreline and the shoreline's losing to the bay. Now down in that area, actually, the bay is in people's backyards at high tide. And it's scary. So we have a big project down there. And we're seeing the same things in Delaware Bay where we're doing uh, more restoration like this where it's edge restoration, also raising elevations and things like that, doing things called like thin layer, which we haven't done yet, but we do have permits in to do it. Um, we've been doing more stuff with the Quar and actually raising the marsh up down in Delaware Bay by two feet Because that's what it needed, you know, to be honest with it. So what you're seeing here, this is really cool So remember I told you to look that way What do you think is that what does that mean for this area right here? What if a big nor'easter came through where do you think that's gonna hit? <laughs> Speak out don't be scared <laughs> Where's the nor'easter gonna hit? Here. Here, exactly where we're right on it. So as it comes through, the entire inlet right here, the full fetch and force of that, wide open, is coming right here. Every time. So when that keeps happening, boom, 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 this gets pounded. But that's not the only reason why we're getting erosion. What do you see here? They're actually coming in right now. Boat wakes. So we have constant in the summertime, boats in and out, even though it's a no wake zone, they slowly chew away at the, at the shoreline. Slowly, slowly. Same thing you're going to see down uh, at some other projects. The south winds in the summer, very gentle, but can rip the marsh apart after time. And that's what we're seeing is sea levels rising, it's taking that low marsh away. So for this project, we partnered with Neptune, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, uh, the county. And what's great too, and Zach, I remembered it. The sand was all donated from the county. Wow. Neptune provided the trucks to bring it in. That's cost savings, right, for the project because the condo associate Neptune split the cost, but we wanted to keep costs down, okay? Um, the sand is orange, but you don't know why. Okay. Iron oxide, okay? So it's sand that's coated with iron oxide. When we first started this project, we had silk curtains all around this whole thing because you have to. And it would leach out into the, into the water. And people were like, oh my God, all your sand's going into the, into the inlet. But it wasn't. It was actually not happening at all. It was the coloration leaching out of the sand. So we had to tell people that so they understood that. Um, and, and, and part of what we have to do is by regulation. So what Zach was telling you about living shorelines, in New Jersey, Coastal zone management rules say, before you do a hard structure, you have to look at a living shoreline. If that living shoreline's not gonna work, you have to do a hybrid living shoreline. If that's not gonna work, then you can go to a hard structure. Years past, they didn't have enough resources to actually enforce that. Now they are. So you have to look at these kind of things. Zach was right. Ecological uplift, that's huge. But also as a restoration practitioner, we look at the goods and services that this can provide to our community too. So it's a balance again, remember I said in the beginning, smart, balanced restoration that provides what you want. You have different goals. A goal to this project actually is to stop wave action and things like that from erosion. Secondary is ecological uplift. That's where I come in. Um, so it's designed a little bit differently than you might see for something else. The sill might be lower, you know, if it's more ecological. This is a little bit higher just because of the crest of the waves and things like that, that as it was modeled through by the engineers. So this is a hybrid living shoreline. Like, I, like Zach said, we think it's one of the only ones that we know of right now in New Jersey. 
And what you're really trying to do is take the harder structure and tie it into the natural structure, okay? And you're gonna see here as we go through a couple different cool things that we've done. E-Concrete was big. That's one of our big partners on this. Uh, they designed all this type of concrete. Uh, one thing Zach said was scour. If you look when you get a chance, and you can walk on this, just stay away from the Iliocris and the, kind of the, sli the slippery stuff down on that side. Um, you're gonna see that there's gaps. This is with cables in between. That gives it flexibility. So when we have reflection of wave energy and a scour, it's gonna kind of drop in and dig in and still maintain that slope. You want a very gentle slope for living shorelines. You want the waves to come up and dissipate as they come up. And that's what this is doing. Uh, and we're gonna monitor that to see if it really works. This may not work in a high, high energy environment. Again, when you're doing living shorelines, you look at the energy of the environment too. Low energy, medium, high, super high, you know. Um, this does get the brunt of a lot. So I would say this is kind of a mid to high energy environment. So this will do a, a more of a dissipation of energy. The sill, when you look at that in combination, so where this ends and it starts in with a sill, that sill is gonna kind of reflect that energy. But underneath, there's a little bit of matting, so you don't get that scour kind of a piece to it, okay? You have a gap in that sill. Each one of these sills is about 100 feet, I think. So you have 200 feet of sill that ties back into the marsh where it was really eroding. The gap is so water comes in and water goes out, okay? You want your critters to come in. The other thing though, if you see down here, you're gonna see some of the stakes, um, and you see the quar logs here. There's quar logs alongside of that sill too, and they're, they're planted with plugs. We actually plugged it with Spartina alterniflora to really root in that because eventually the quar is gonna be gone. But we didn't want a heavy erosion coming in from that gap. So the quar cuts right across that gap too. We designed the elevation in a way that we hit the honey spot, okay? So it comes down to mean sea level, zero. If it's zero, that's where Spartina goes, the alternative flora. So from that up to your, your line around that area, that's the sweet spot where you wanna plant. You can go down to mean low, we'll see how that works. You can see the Spartina there. Yeah, it's covered with stuff because we have all of it in here or sea lettuce, things like that. As the tide drops, it lands on the plants. As the tide comes up, it leaves the plants. You see a bunch of stakes here and fishing line. And fishing line that has mylar on it. Any idea why we would stake things out and make a grid with mylar tape, reflective tape? Well, so that animals can see it as it's reflected, right? Yes. And those animals are birds. And one of our big enemies out here, or who we have to deal with, is the Canada goose. So the Canada goose is gonna, there goes a blue heron right there. A Canada goose is gonna fly in here in the flat, and they're gonna eat everything. They're gonna take it right out. That's, that, that's not very good. So we have to set up a bird deterrent, a grid. They don't see the fishing line, they see the reflective tape. So that scares them a little bit. If they do land the fishing line, they can't get through it and they're confused and so they leave. That gives us time to actually let the plants establish where they don't wanna feed on it anymore. So we come out here every now and then look at this. It's, it's looking pretty good overall. Yeah, the tide's taking it up and down. We planted this, what, two, three months ago, I think. So I think we're doing pretty good overall. The geese aren't here right now. So hopefully by spring, we'll be all set. Alternative flora establishes pretty easily, supposedly. So we'll see. Um, but we're hoping by the spring, we're gonna see a big difference. Where you see, you're gonna see two different things here too, which is awesome. Um, on the edge, you see the taller grass? That's Spartina alternative flora, okay? That's the taller form behind it. That's Spartina alterniflora, a short form. When Zach and I and Julie, and Julie, welcome. I don't know if he, Julie's the habitat restoration technician out of Sandy Hook. Um, when we first walked through here, there's another plant called saltwort or testiculus, and it's mixed in with a short form. We were thinking, hey, wait a minute. Is this short form for sure, or is this high marsh plant? Are we, don't have any low marsh, just high marsh? No, we have low marsh, no high marsh. <laughs> So we have kind of a mix of, to me, it's, it's more stressed, you know, in, in a way, but it is what it is. So hopefully everything else here takes, eventually we get the taller form on the edges here, and that's gonna dissipate some wave energy too. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna hit that sill, 
stuff's going to come in through. The quar log's going to dissipate it a little bit, and then the marsh will naturally dissipate that. But we're also creating habitat for fiddler crabs. Um, it's a nursery for fish. Also, you're going to have your killifish in here, which is a, a major food source for other species here. And, and we saw that right away. Once we put this in behind this area where it's a little more quiet, we had quite a bit of killifish coming in in schools. And then we've seen here quite a few seagulls hanging out. Like all of a sudden, here they are. So we built some habitat here and we're monitoring that over time to see what's using it. But it became an area that used to not have anything. It just <laughs> came right up to here. Now we have some, some availability for, for this as well as protecting the people here. So partly, one of the things is it was designed with this black cloth. I'm not a fan of it. Anybody else a fan of it? Hands down, okay. Um, that's what the engineer had. We're in the pandemic. This is what we could get um, to kind of keep the bank stable until the, remember I talked about roots? Mm -hmm. the important, what, why you think they're so important? Well, if they're deeper, they'll hold on, right? Boom, right on. Yeah, so the roots are gonna kind of hold everything together. What we're talking about uh, this morning was, we're gonna come in here with a razor knife, cut all this out, probably while the plants are still small in the spring, and pull this out. That way we can naturally establish it. And I think by then with the quar logs, pinning it in, we'll be okay, but the slope might change a little bit on some of this, and that's okay too. You know, it's, again, remember, Mother Nature's gonna kinda tell us what to do adaptive manage-wise. So this berm, all the way around, will we'll we'll cut that out, and it'll start growing naturally, okay? So the other thing that we did here, and working with the regulators, so there's the ecological side of things, there's a regulation side of things and what you have to comply with. Um, we have to monitor certain transects uh, every season and see how things are growing. If it's not growing and we don't have 80% coverage, we have to come back and replant. We're okay with that. You know, we're learning here. Um, but also, uh, in between these blocks, and you can see some of this here, and we've lost some of it, and actually down where there's sand, that's in between blocks. We took crowbars and things like that and moved those blocks around and underneath that's a matting, poke through it and plant in Spartina alterniflora. When and if that takes, we're gonna come to next year. It's not gonna be fun, but you guys are welcome to come. <laughs> no, I, I take that back, it's gonna be super fun and everybody's gonna have a great time. It's gonna be great. We're gonna plant between the cracks between mean sea level. Remember, that's the place where we wanna be in that area with all this Spartina and really soften up this shoreline. And then it'll be a true hybrid um, if we can piece all that together with that root mass and the concrete. The Spartina is going to provide a function as well, not just for habitat, but wave attenuation. So it's a win-win for us. So that's about it with everything. You know, we do have some of the natural stuff still here. Um, I want you guys to kind of ask questions, look around. You can see that looks very small. That's 50 plants of goldenrod we're going to plant today. Um, and then when we go to the maritime forest to walk through there to the dunes, we got 500 for you. <laughs> so the back of Zach's truck, if you saw it, that's all yours. And we're gonna have some fun and we have 50 more of those. And you're gonna kind of learn where these plants go. That seaside goldenrod, it's a native species. Um, we plant all native species. You're gonna see some living shorelines where maybe the community doesn't want all native species. They want something else. But you can really use these plants to make something aesthetic based on the seasons and things like that. And it's about sometimes, uh, which we didn't mention, outreach. Outreach to your community. Remember I said talk to the stakeholders early? Outreach and communication and really letting people know what you're trying to do here helps them embrace and engage in that project. Um, and there's a lot you can do with native plants. So anyway, that's me and Zach and Julie and Nicole in a nutshell of what we kind of do. We're going to get you guys ready to plant. You guys stoked? All right. What was that? <laughs> yes. All right, let's do it. Come on. Can I? Can I? Before we do, I have to ask. Or you guys? Is anyone wondering? What are we doing about the fragmentation? How do we yeah, stop that from? Just, oh, I'm glad. You know, I forgot all that. <laughs> Zach and Julie here. They're like, hey, Catherine. I'm so afraid that it's just going to take over. Quit going off on tangents. <laughs> That's okay. So this was designed in a way. Originally, they wanted to come in. Uh, well, it was suggested to come in, herbicide that mow it whatever get it down herbicide I'm not an herbicide fan but if you look when you come down here with me and, and kind of take a peek 
that's the only thing saving the condos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why, don't get rid of it. You know, that we had a discussion about it. It's going to take years to eradicate that Phragmites. And look at it, it's already coming up through the concrete, mm -hmm. through the fabric, everything. So we know it's going to come in. There's not much you can do about it. So for this project, we're actually embracing the invasive. Okay. Um, as it comes through, it's, it, it was cost as well. But we couldn't wait two or three years mm -hmm. for the Phragmites, then build these dunes, or build these berms, and then hope the berms aren't infested with invasives anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think it was, a, it was a good decision. Use the root mass that's holding in the marsh and protecting the condos right now, and, and go from there. So not always is an invasive not your friend. Mm -hmm. And again, remember I said it depends on your objectives of your project. The project's main goal, protect these condos, protect that infrastructure, then provide the ecological uplift and things like that. And that's what we want to do. So it's a little reversed what we would usually do, but the going thing now in, in the state is resiliency. We're losing shoreline. How do, we, how do we become more resilient? And this is one of these ideas. So with the sill, this kind of, for better choice of words, this revetment, this modified revetment, which you'll hear that word sometimes, the revetment is kind of like a, a stone kind of a thing that goes around a peninsula in a way. And then with the quar logs and the marsh plantings, it's a big mix of stuff that we're going to learn from, and then we can apply it to other, to other places, maybe on a, a larger scale. So I'm glad you brought up the frag. Not, and, and, and the discussions are big. People mm -hmm. are like, no, get rid of it. No, I want to keep it. Mm -hmm. Does it have habitat value? Mm -hmm. I don't know. The, the thing that you're going to see at the Maritime Forest, Japanese knotweed. Oh my God. Does it have value? Well, it does to the red winged blackbird, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So do you, you try to get rid as much as you can um, if you have to. At the Maritime Forest, we wanted to get rid of it. And we've got a lot of it out of there, but it still comes back. And that, that, that thing, just like Phragmites, which is a tough one, but knotweed propagates on its own stems. Yeah. So if you break it up, it's going to come back even worse. Yeah. So you have to be very careful. We have a project that we're starting up in Seagirt where they took out about a 50 foot by 100 foot swath in the dune area of all knotweed. And what they did is they kind of grubbed it. So they actually came in with this drum barrel with spikes, flipped it. Oh my gosh. And what do you think that's going to do? Well, hello, more knotweed. Oh my right? But they had a plan, and their plan is to get it up, and then they come and paint it. And when I say paint, they paint it with an herbicide. And they usually do that over time. And we think, um, and, and that's perfectly legal. You can do it as well as you, you're licensed. They'll paint that, that'll kill it, then we'll come in and we'll plant and hopefully we'll beat out the knotweed in establishment. And you'll see that we actually did that in Bradley Beach in a lot of spots at that maritime forest. It's still there, but it used to be like 100% there. Now there's maybe four or 5% of it. Wow, that's great. So what we're gonna do guys is, um, we'll just give a little walk down here, we'll come back up, and then we're gonna grab some trowels, prepare to get dirty. If you plant all 50 and you want 50 more, hey, we got them. <laughs> so we're not, we're not scared to give them to you. All right. Any other questions right now? And, and feel free as, as the day comes on. We're here to just interact with us. We're here to interact with you. No questions are bad questions. If you don't ask it, you'll never know. And we might not have the answer anyway. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Thanks, guys. That was perfect.